This is the Monday, August 24th, 2015 episode of the History Author Show. Visit our iHeartRadio channel or subscribe on iTunes to enjoy a brand new episode every Monday morning. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old towns of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline, on the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys, oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Hello and welcome. You're listening to The History Author Show. Thank you for tuning in on iHeartRadio iTunes, or wherever else in the internet card catalog you found us. I want to start today's show with a question. What is worse? A Confederate con man claiming he was Abraham Lincoln's spy throughout the Civil War, or the Union veteran who pursued his false claim all the way to the Supreme Court and knew he was lying? That's the central question of Jane Singer's book, Lincoln's Secret Spy, the Civil War case that changed the future of espionage. In it, she and co-author John Stewart introduce us to William Alvin Lloyd. Con man, bigamist, charlatan, Lloyd hobbled out of the defeated Confederacy and into the capital of the newly reunited states. And he had a claim that made people listen. The government owes me money, he said, for serving as Abraham Lincoln's spy during the war. John Wilkes Booth had shot down the Great Emancipator just a month earlier in April of 1865, and so he couldn't confirm or refute the story, obviously. So armed with Lincoln's signature on a travel pass and a skill for duping people, including no less than Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, who was at the president's side when he died, Lloyd teamed up with lawyer Enoch Totten, who'd served in the Union during the conflict. The story of their conspiracy to defraud the American people is brought to us by my guest today, Jane Singer. Jane is a Civil War scholar and author of other works, including The Confederate Dirty War. That book served as the basis of the History Channel special, Civil War Terror. You can follow her at facebook.com slash author, or on Twitter under the handle JaneBSinger1. That's Jane B. Singer and the number one. Okay, let's leave the era of clicks and computers and cars behind and go back to the era of Lincoln's secret spy. This is more than a tale of long ago fraud. The Supreme Court ruling in Totten v. United States is a legal precedent that affects our clandestine operatives to this day, and it's all built on a lie. Here's my conversation with Jane about this intricate tale of espionage and lies. I'm joined now by Jane Singer, author of Lincoln's Secret Spy. Thank you for making the time for us today. You're very welcome, Dean. The subhead of your book says this case, quote, changed the future of espionage. We're living in that future now. Obviously, it's 150 years since the case. Give us an example of how this fraud by Lloyd and Enoch Totten, his lawyer, influences spycraft today. Well, the Totten Doctrine or Totten Precedent, Totten Bar, as it's come to be known over time, was a Supreme Court precedent that prohibits a public hearing, and I'm quoting now, where a disclosure of the Secret Service might compromise or embarrass our government in its public duties or endanger the person or injure the character of the agent. So if a CIA operative is working for the government in any capacity, and he has been promised protection, relocation, back pay, and let's say something might happen to that person, or that person may decide to try to recover what he feels has been lost, he cannot sue the government for this in a public court for fear the disclosure of the Secret Service would compromise or embarrass the government. And that's a fairly critical precedent, in my opinion. Even though this is exposed as being based on a fraud, it's still the law of the land, as everybody likes to say now about things. This, and Yet it's built really on one man, just a driven liar, who really pushed it and brought other people along. It's amazing. It is amazing. William Alvin Lloyd allegedly signed a contract with Abraham Lincoln 
to go forth and spy in the Confederacy. And when he came back conveniently and Lincoln had passed away, he then began to orchestrate what he believed and what he and his lawyer concocted was the perfect scheme. And that was to recover monies promised to him. The question, of course, I would ask repeatedly is, can a precedent, settled law based on a fraud, is it possible ever to overturn that precedent for the very reason that it is based on the fraud? However, the tricky thing here is this Totten precedent actually was a matter of principle. Even though William Alvin Lloyd and his lawyer Enoch Totten attempted to and did create this fraud, the ultimate principle that the Supreme Court decided was not so much about the veracity of William Alvin Lloyd as alleged spy. And the basis of the case that he brought was that he had been Lincoln's spy, and he said, well, okay, now you're going to have to pay me. Mm -hmm. And so he kept fighting this. And yes, yes. Well, my, my understanding, and again, I'm not a legal scholar, but I have interviewed many lawyers over time. My understanding is as follows. If, again, an agent or an asset attempted to sue their employer, i.e., the federal government, the CIA, some branch of the CIA, for promise protections and back pay, whatever they felt they were deserving of, true or not, they could not sue in a public court for fear of such secrets in a quote-unquote secret contract being revealed. Right. Like you couldn't have a deposition, for instance, with SEAL Team 6 and call in a bunch of the other guys and say, OK, give a deposition and reveal who you are, because obviously then everybody would know their names and what their faces were. And that Yes, kind of yes, yes. Uh, the last time this precedent, the Totten precedent, was actually invoked was in 2005 in a case called Tenet, meaning George Tenet of the CIA versus Doe. Now, John Doe was, of course, not John Doe. He was a spy working for the CIA in an Eastern Bloc country. And he wanted, with his wife, who was also working, spying for the United States government, to defect. And the CIA said, okay, but you have to keep working for us in America, not in the Eastern Bloc country. And they said, okay. What happened eventually was, they both decided they didn't want to do it anymore, and they moved to Washington State, where I believe John Doe um, received just sort of regular employment. He wasn't, he wasn't any longer a spy. And then he decided, wait a second here. I'm, I'm feeling like I had all this time risking a lot of things. I'd like to come back. And they said, no. He also revealed that he was homosexual, and they said, really, no. Really, no. So at that point, um, he attempted to sue, and it was barred by the Totten Rule. And Justice Rehnquist rendered the decision and said, we stand with Totten. In other words, Totten barred the Doe's from receiving anything. And you mentioned there two names I just want to point out if people aren't sure. picking it up that when you say George Tennant, you're talking the CIA, the director of the CIA at the time. Yeah, that's and you're talking that's Rehnquist. Correct. He's the chief justice of the Supreme that's Court, correct. the highest. So this is not a small little you walked your dog on somebody's lawn. This is at not the very bit. highest level bit. of government that this is happening. Yes, and the majority ruled for Totten, the majority in the Supreme Court. It was it was six to zero. So, no, it's not, it's not a small thing at all. And I think what intrigued me from the very beginning, apart from finding out about this so-called spy of Lincoln's called William Alvin Lloyd, was this fascinating case. I thought, what the heck is that about? The human story is something you can, without giving away the, the end, it really right, reads right, like right. a spy thriller. When I was researching your book, Lincoln's Secret Spy, you would read the word thriller. And if for a minute you'd say, gosh, this is fact. And yet people are using the same language as they do with a fiction writer to describe it. Thank you. I, I appreciate that because that's basically, <laughs> that's my style. That's my narrative style. And thank you for saying that. I was trying to make it a little bit less academic, all the while sourcing like mad and making sure that all my citations were absolutely correct. 
but I was trying to create a style that would be more readable. So I was trying to kind of bridge the gap between a fictional sensibility all the while adhering to diligent nonfiction. So thanks for saying that. Most sure. I mean, it's the truth. So that's always easy to say the truth, right? The lies are hard things to say, except (laughs) if you are, this brings us right back. See, that was a good segue. Right back to here, talking about (laughs) this fake spy. The lying came so naturally for him. And I was thinking, was this really a logical story that a president, Lincoln, would have hired him out of the CSA to go there and spy on them? Did did it really seem plausible? How did he fool these people? Well, at the outset... I must say, William Alvin Lloyd was the publisher of something called Lloyd's Southern Steamboat and Railroad Guide. And Southern here is, is, you know, is an important uh, thing to think about. Lloyd would frequently go south to collect, to sell ads to various um, uh, folks, to collect money from them, uh, mechanical makers, you know, cotton planters, farmers, anyone who wanted to advertise in his publication. So he was truthfully and really going south. So if you think about it, um, did Abraham Lincoln hire him to spy for him? Absolutely not. That was what took three years of research and and many Eurekas along the way. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it, it might have been a pretty good cover if it were true after the Civil War began in order to cross enemy lines into the Confederacy. You had to have some sort of pass. And so he actually obtained a pass either from Lincoln or perhaps Lincoln's secretary. There's no record of it, of course, because there's no record of William Malcolm Lloyd. But the pass was authentic. And that was the only authentic truth in the entire pile of mistruths and confabulations. So this pass simply said, please allow W.A. Lloyd, I'm reciting from memory, to cross the line south and return on special business. Now, the special business was prosaic. It was banal. It was to get ad money. So would it have been a good cover? Yeah except that there is absolutely no record, no murmur, no whisper of Abraham Lincoln ever hiring a spy to do anything remotely resembling this or hiring any spy for that matter. And we know that he was a disreputable character, as they would say back then. So it's not as if he was a legitimate businessman who never stepped outside the law or did anything bad. He he was a real uh, born to the con, you wrote, which I thought was a great phrase, yes, so I'll yes, steal it. Yes. But, <laughs> but yes. he was a, a repellent character. I mentioned this thing that he ran a minstrel show, uh, white actors yes. in blackface for people that aren't familiar, acting out yes, racist yes, stereotypes. Yes. And you think of a union veteran and you think, being involved with somebody, you may not have known about that, but still, here's a Confederate walking out. You know that he's lying and trying to defraud the U.S. It just sort of shows, as we were talking about when we spoke off the air, that it's not as cut and dry as, okay, you have Lincoln, you have Jefferson Davis, you have Grant, you have Lee. This guy is a Union veteran. I wonder how you react. Yes, yes, yes. Here's this guy who's betraying his country. How did you feel? You said eureka moments. What, were, what was your exclamation well, for that? Uh, well, first of all, because William Alvin Lloyd has been listed repeatedly, if you Google him, you will see repeated instances, both derivative and, uh, you know, sort of quasi-original, about the fact that he was, yes, Lincoln's spy. Right. Here was somebody who was a serial bigamist, a convicted felon for various scams and bilks that he pulled, you know, throughout the years, and a minstrel empresario. And I thought, wow. So here's William Melvin Lloyd, who is absolutely ingenious about his business ventures, because one would fail, he'd get thrown in jail, he'd figure something else out to do. And it became minstrelsy. And that happened very early on. He was just in his 20s, when a minstrel troupe came to Louisville, which is where he was born and raised. He was born in Kentucky, raised in Louisville. And This troop came to town, and soon after that, Lloyd was gone, you know, sort of evaporated. He was trained as a tailor, we learned, which is like, okay, that's a fairly substantial trade. But all of a sudden, he left a wife, a child, and another child on the way, and disappeared in a puff of smoke, literally, from Louisville, and went off, and within, I think, 
18 months, had become the leader of a highly successful minstrel troupe. That troupe had many, 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 many incarnations. And that, I think, affected me more deeply in some ways than any of Lloyd's cons, except the final one when he defrauded the U.S. government, because I thought Jim Crow minstrelsy. Jim Crow is with us still, perhaps in you know varied incarnations, but that's where it came from. That's where it came from, and that was the mallet by which, over generations, so many African Americans were brutalized, disenfranchised, exploited, on and on and on. So for me, that was not just a eureka, it was a gut punch. When you find that about the character, that removes any chance a character in your book, this real person we're talking about, Lloyd, yeah. and you say, that's that that makes it hard then to write the book, doesn't it, about somebody in a, in a way? It doesn't or, make it, no, it doesn't make it hard at all because it's telling the truth of who he was. You know, he was many things. And also, I had to keep reminding myself to take off my 21st century hat and remember that this was an incredibly popular form of entertainment. And you could sit and hoot your brains out. I think it comforted at some level, or it reinforced for Southerners, certainly, the notion that life on the plantation was just swell, that these people were happy and singing and well cared for. Did it make writing the book harder? Absolutely not. This was a mission to find the truth of who this person was, how he moved through the world, and ultimately what he did after Lincoln was assassinated. And it was three years of a remarkable and energizing research project, if nothing else. I'm sure it was also exciting. You could go two ways. Obviously, you did not go the way where you were repelled by this person for his lies, but you wanted to chase him down and expose him, and you did that. Exactly. And, and so that, exactly was, right. that was a a great thing to do when you find that and you say, gosh, like I find that when I find false quotes or something like that and I see yeah. them on Facebook and I just say, my gosh, you know, Lincoln may well have had this sentiment, but uh, he didn't uh, he didn't say it. So don't use it. And so <laughs> that's exactly, that kind of exactly. thing. And this period, there was so much fraud going on. They, they referred to it as the era of good stealing sometimes, a play on the era of good feeling. Right. I noted that. Actually, I, if I'm not mistaken, Lloyd died in 1869, and the era of good stealing, or as it's often referred to as the Gilded Era, just began shortly after he died, and he was a good stealer. He would have, had he lived, he would have been just fine, because he was not, even though he walked away with over $2,000 in gold and never got paid anymore because he died, and neither did his lawyer, he would have been just fine. He would have just continued conning because I don't think he knew any other way to move through the world. I mean, he could mm -hmm. he could show you a good suit, but that wasn't exciting. He was a career <laughs> criminal. You had a co-author also. How did you collaborate with John Stewart? And I wanted to say to you, I don't suppose it was anything like uh, Lloyd and Totten, his lawyer. Your collaboration? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we were we colluded in in exposing. Let's put it this way. Okay. And and you know attempting to, to do historical detective work. I would say it, it was a collusion, but it was a remarkable collaboration. It's my first ever collaboration. And one of the things that was so helpful is that we both were riveted by this project. I brought the idea to John because we were working on something else about Civil War espionage, which is kind of my other passion, you know, meaning lady spies and Pinkerton and, and folks like that. And I said, John, did you ever hear about William Alvin Lloyd? I said, I came upon this amazing case. So we started not so much with a book in mind, but a research project in mind. And along we went until we suddenly realized, by gum, this is a book. We never decided, met, by the way. You never met, we've right? Never, we've amazing. never met. It's so amazing. <laughs> we've been friends for about six years. He lives in the mountains of North Carolina, as he would like to say. He's a Scotsman via Britain, via Australia, via I forget where else. I'm born and raised in Virginia, living in California many years, and we have a similar love of not just history, but of attacking, you know, sort of like mad dogs and trying to pry history off its hinges. Mm -hmm. So we, we thought, wait a second here, this is looking better and better. John is a timeline wizard. He's a writer of many, 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 many reference books. He's an amazing genealogist. He's a fact maven. 
And I thought, you know what? I'm going to write a proposal. I approached my literary agent because something new is, is very difficult to find in, in my field. Yeah, especially, Something yes. new, something that hasn't been, you know, talked about or written about. So that's how it came to be, and we've never regretted a moment of it. Yeah, in fact, I wanted to mention, with a million Lincoln books on the shelves, as many or more about the Civil War in general, the New York Journal of Books paid you and John Stewart a great compliment. They wrote, Yes, they did. The nonfiction market is currently flooded with works of limited scholarship that tell stories already better told or not worth the bother. This work, however, that's Lincoln's Secret Spy, your book, <laughs> represents substantial scholarship in records only seldom used. Uh, it's amazing. You managed to find something new about the Civil War and Abraham Lincoln that people didn't know 150 years yes, later. Yes, and I treasure, I treasure the moment that we began to understand just how important this was. I must say, I ordered a microfilm from the National Archives, and it's from letters to the provost marshal general in, I believe it's 1860 to 1872. And it had the entire William Alvin Lloyd case. Now, this is after we'd already read his biography, deciphered his, you know, ridiculous crimes, and thought, wait a second, here is the entire file that no one obviously had ever looked at or started to really comb because it was astounding, and it revealed what, in a sense, folks can read in the book, exactly how we figured out certain things about this case. I'm speaking with author Jane Singer, and the book is Lincoln's Secret Spy, the Civil War case that changed the future of espionage. If you'd like to see what Jane is up to on social media, you can follow her at Jane B. Singer one That's Jane B. Singer with the number one on the end. That's on Twitter, and like her at facebook.com slash Jane Singer author. Now, I wanted to get back to the big lie, because that's what I've taken to calling it here when I'm reading the book. It's just huge, and you th- I, I don't know how these people sleep at night. I say, I say sometimes to my wife, Kathy, I say, I don't know how people cheat, because I feel unfaithful if I go to a different Duane Reed in the city. I'm, I'm thinking, <laughs> okay, the, the, the people from the other Duane Reed are going to see me, wonder why I'm buying milk here. So I don't know how these people <laughs> run around, and yeah, the, never, never mind the, the fidelity and moral issues, but just how do you just lie through your teeth, and it takes on this whole life of its own, you have to remember so many plates spinning. And you mentioned, for instance, that Lloyd dies before this era of good stealing begins. Really, his death doesn't even end the lie. That's how big this is. No, it doesn't is. at all. It, it doesn't at all, no. And if you're asking me about, because I too was appalled at his character, I can't imagine being able to blithely, uh, you know, and happily in a sense, uh, concoct, confabulate, but he did. And so was that because he was perhaps a sociopath? Was he lacking a moral compass? I mean, perhaps we'll never know that, but I guess there are folks out there who would happily go to 50 Dwayne Reeds and not give it a second thought. <laughs> so, yeah, so to speak. But he, and well, not he, to make light of it. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. But it, it's amazing that he... Everything he used as part of the lie, and I'd mentioned to you that he spent time in a Confederate prison, and he used that as saying, look, see, they threw me in there as a spy. They threw him in for bigamy, and they, as you said, the other things that he'd spent time in. And I said, well, he even made lemons out of lemonade for that, and you had a funny response. You said, actually, there was no lemonade. No, there was no lemonade. The, pro- the, the truth is, the penalty for being caught as a spy in the Confederacy was hanging on the spot, um, the provost marshal general and subsequent head of all Richmond prisons, John H. Winder, discovered that a trusted courier by the name of Timothy Webster turned out to be one of Alan Pinkerton's most prized operatives. When it was discovered, Winder had him hanged, and that was in April of 1862. Now, when Alvin Lloyd was was only in prison twice, in spite of the fact that he told the government he was in prison more times. The first time was not for being a Yankee spy in Memphis, but it was for bigamy. The second time, he was imprisoned in Savannah, Georgia, 
in part because he was parading around with a woman who clearly was not his wife, his tormentor and the commander of the post in Savannah called Oglethorpe Barracks was one William Spencer Rockwell, who was absolutely outraged and perhaps just a little bit jealous of this person who seemed to sashay about with various women on his arm and his real wife comes to visit. So apart from the fact that he probably was a suspicious and flashy character, he was in prison for eight and a half months in rather stark and and brutal conditions. The Confederate authorities wanted to find the goods on him. They wanted to hang him high. They never could. So when he came back to D.C. after Lincoln was killed and Only after Lincoln was killed could this plot have been hatched because Lincoln would have said, Lloyd who, had Mm -hmm. he come back and said, hi, President Lincoln, it's me. When he came back to D.C., I suspect that he thought to himself, wait a second here, they almost hanged me because they thought I was a Yankee spy. Why don't I just be that? Why don't I claim that that's exactly what I was and I suffered and I served for the late lamented leader? The condition, the physical condition that he returned to D.C., he was a wreck. He was partially paralyzed. He was in terrible health. He was in his early 40s, which back then was not like early 40s today, which is like young. Mm -hmm. But the paralysis, we discovered, was not from lying on cold prison floors. It's because he tried to expose Union-born, Northern-born people living in the Confederacy and tried to out them and blackmail them. He was shot by a mob in Mobile, Alabama. <laughs> and it was the shot, I'm not really, it was the shooting. It, it made headlines throughout much of the South. The shooting is what nearly killed him, not the prison. But by gosh, there he was. You know, he was like an imposter. It was the most extraordinary kind of imposter. Because perhaps at some level, um, he sort of slipped into that character just as he, when he led his minstrel troops proudly around and paraded along with them. At that moment, he was the king of the minstrels. So maybe, you know, maybe he had the kind of chameleon shape-shifting sort of personality that would allow him to, to be what he thought he should be for his own gain. It was always about his own gain. Yes, he was a Confederate supporter. Yes, he couldn't bear the Lincoln administration. He hated what he called the abolitionists, which were obviously the folks that wanted most of all to free slaves well before it was the thing to do. He hated that. He was a Southern man, but to his own ends, he wasn't. He was a loyal Lincoln man. And I find that it's stunning. It's stunning. He must have been an amazing actor. You can understand him doing it once you paint the picture in the book of him. You say all these background details you're giving us, these things that he did, the the bigamy, which was a serious and horrible crime to... Pre- very, very terrible crime. I mean, that would ruin you. Women didn't have the ability to work and own property like men would. And I think with him, you would say, okay, this makes sense. He would be the villain. But then you come over to Enoch Totten and you say, just as Lloyd was a tailor and he could have made a good living at it, you mm-hmm. say, Totten is a lawyer. He had to have some prospects. He's he served. He was a veteran. He would have gotten his Grand Army pension, I assume. And you have one picture in the book, and he looks sheepish in it. I, I really like old pictures, as probably yes. will come as no surprise. But he's not facing the camera. He's sort of looking away. And to me, it's almost as if in that split second of his life, he knows history will expose his collusion, that you and John Stewart someday will track him down. <laughs> um, but when I asked you about that, you mentioned an interesting thing about one of the descendants that I wanted you to pass on. Yes, yes. Um, I've been posting a lot about the book on Facebook, and Edith Howe, H-O-W-E, Totten, Totten's great, let me see if I can get the greats right, great, 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 I believe. Forgive me, Edie, if I've one graded <laughs> or not graded. Um, granddaughter contacted me and said, oh boy, that's my ancestor. So Edie uh, was thrilled to read the book. She's a marvelous, articulate, bright woman. And she uh, said, oh boy, she said, you know, 
her mother had always said that her mother's mother didn't speak much about Totten. But um, in Totten's defense, and this is a very brief defense because he was really indefensible, but very briefly, he was new in town. Claims were pouring in at the time Lloyd brought his claim from everywhere. If someone lost a bunch of mules because of union, um, you know, union outrages or a well was poisoned or railroad tracks were, were torn up, Totten was new in D.C. and a claims lawyer. And in walks this person. Now, I truly believe that Totten knew from the very beginning. He had to have known that Lloyd was a fraud because he created a fictitious contract. Now, I don't know. Was he hungry? He was not yet married. He married um, uh, a lady, I've forgotten her first name, but it was the Howe family, H-O-W-E. They were the uh, the sewing machine Bob and Kings. Very, very wealthy family, but he hadn't yet married her. He hadn't met her yet. So he was hungry, and this was probably too good to be true. And he figured, he probably figured, now maybe he had a crisis of conscience after this, but I kind of doubt it, because he pursued this to the Supreme Court. So was it ego? Was it a need to to be as crooked as as the person he was representing? I, I don't know. I don't know whether it was his seduction or whether he too was to the con born. Yeah. 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 So it was it was an amazing collusion. And I think maybe you are a lawyer you're sitting there. It's a little bored. You see everybody else getting away with it and stealing from the government. And you he had served and he probably ate a lot of rotten food. He was a and war saw horrible he things. Was a yeah. war he was a wounded, a wounded warrior. See, I'm not so sure that he saw people stealing. I think he was a claims attorney and you make a claim and you hope to hell that you can gain financially from it. Now, was this, uh, you know, clearly this was, was an, an incredible fraud? Was there part of him that, that was thrilled by that? Was it the art of the, of the fraud? I don't know. I don't know. What was very frustrating for me, I actually, and together with John, we went trying to find any of Totten's briefs, anything, anything that might have recorded this case. Because... Right after Totten died, I believe it was in 1892, somewhere around there, he was eulogized in a D.C. law journal. And one of the people that was eulogizing him said, I'm sitting right across from all of his briefs, and I thought, oh, I need to jump into that story. (laughs) So we were never able to find, nor did we ever find any record of him writing about this, you know, preposterous invention except what he wrote about, you know, making firm statements about, yes, this man was Lincoln's spy, and this is the amount of money I'm looking for, and it's now up to $11,000. That's a shame, but this is what he's owed for expenses, and his poor wife is starving, and kid is, you know, I mean, he was, when he became the administrator of Lloyd's estate, um, is when he started to knuckle down again. And this is in 1871. So he's dead already. So he never, never gave up on this. Never gave up on it. And I, I don't know why. I don't want to, you know, sort of put uh, a motive or create a character that may or may not have been accurate. I do know that he speaks well for himself, you know. Mm. I mean, his words are indisputable, except that he never said, he was, how can I sleep at night because I've perpetrated a fraud and possibly committed treason. No, we've never found anything like that. Never. <laughs> and they really were risking their lives. I said to you, yes. Lloyd also wrote to Robert E. Lee at one point. And as you said before, looking at it with modern eyes, which is something I have never been accused of before. Usually it's quite the opposite, that I still live in the Victorian era and give people landmarks in 1901 in New York sometimes. <laughs> they say that the <laughs> Churchill hasn't been there in a long time and the Croton Reservoir is no longer there. But anyway, looking at it, at first I thought he was just this self-promoter. But no, no. you pointed out he was it was really the opposite. He was writing for his life. He was desperate. And he wrote to Robert E. Lee. He wrote to Jefferson Davis. He wrote to, I believe, the Secretary of War, Seddon. He wrote to anyone and everyone, and including friends of his, saying, get me the hell out of here. Anyone and everyone that he thought could help him um, put in a word for him. No, no. He was, it was desperate. And he was, yes, he was risking hanging. There's no question about it. 
And Alvin Lloyd, I wanted to say that he was a rambling man. You mentioned about him traveling around. And so I think of that. I was on the train, the North Jersey coastline and past Elberon where President Garfield passed away. And I thought of that idea of the train ride and always running from town to town, the next con coming, the last con you're kind of running away yes, from sometimes. Yes. I think of all those hours on the train and the time. He, at first, he's crisscrossing the U.S. when it's a nation kind of coming apart at the seams. Then he's crossing when it's torn apart. He has that pass from Lincoln. And finally, during the just very early years of Reconstruction, as the nation's being stitched back together, he's out there limping by this time, ruined by the gunshot, as you said. And so I wanted to ask you if you could board one of these trains for one of those long trips. You have no, obviously, iPad back then or anything like that. People <laughs> talked and they you'd open up like Kenny Rogers on the train there with the gambler and, yeah, and people would yeah. have long conversations. If you could step into that Pullman car, get a seat across from Totten and Lloyd, what would you like to get out of them? Let's leave people with that question. Uh, I think it's it's a phenomenal question. Well, first of all, I would ask them both, was it worth it? Was it worth it? Was it worth... Um, and actually, let's separate the two folks on the train. First, my question would be to Enoch Totten. Why, oh, why, oh, why, oh, why did you, at the beginning of what appeared to be and what continued to be, well into your later years before you died, a very respectable and notable career, why did you start with something so terribly criminal? What was the game? And then I would turn to Alvin Lloyd and try to get his attention because he was probably terribly distracted by anyone that was female walking through the train or even standing on the track. I would say, excuse me, why did you do this? And was it, just as I asked your lawyer, was it worth it? Was it worth the years of suffering, the years of abandoning women, of being a predator, I know you probably, Mr. Lloyd, would have justified it by saying you were saving them from a life of bandages and pie dough, of a life of boredom. But honestly, sir, it was a crime punishable by between five and eight years in a hard time in prison. And you probably served a bit of time for that. So who are you? Are you a victimizer? Are you in shame? I doubt that. Was it all worth it? And when you died alone, except for your wife, who stayed with you remarkably to the very end, who was part and parcel of your fraud, what did you, what did you say? Did you apologize to her for a life of, of interminable infidelity? And was the last face that you saw your attending physician a union surgeon? That the last doctor you ever laid eyes on was a Yankee? <laughs> I... He is such a kaleidoscopic and eventful and disturbing person. And then I think, I think, Dean, I would have to get up and leave because I would find myself feeling um, angry. And then I would turn, perhaps, and I would say, and how do you feel about two 21st century authors exposing you, talking in you know, a fairly sensible way about what you did? Were you glad to be the star of your own show finally? Or do you want to take out a gun, as you often did, and they would call it snapping it and then cocking the pistol? Would you like to shoot me for this? I mean, I, I have no idea what he would do or say. Hmm. I suspect he would turn and just begin a conversation with someone else because I'm not sure his personality would have felt he needed to defend anything. But I would be outraged, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, it looks like, as I said, getting back to that Enoch Totten photo, that he was, he looks just a little in that one split second, a little a little more nervous about things. He doesn't look amazing that he was a hero and all that, but it, that would have been tough to sit there and watch you dress him down, dress down his client. Or, or would it have been? <laughs> or would it have been? Or would he have thought to himself, wow, you know, I mean, I took this all the way to the Supreme Court, lady. What's your problem? Yeah, and one. You know? Totten, Enoch Totten, more than William Alvin Lloyd, is with us today. The Totten Doctrine is alive and well. It is steamed and shoved its way through history. So it's very possible, you know, that over brandy and cigars, these two guys, maybe they were both toasting each other. Who knows? Yeah. It's possible. They were that sort of maddening and mysterious and magical all at the same time. 
Well, for The Magic and Mystery, the book is Lincoln's Secret Spy by Jane Singer and her co-author, John Stewart. So you have brought these people to life for us, so thank you for that. Although now, of course, by the end of the book, we want to shoot them a little bit, <laughs> but uh, see them get <laughs> well, what's they coming to them. Shoot but... me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're safe. The, the history can't hurt us, I guess. It could just make us a little bit angry. So again, thank you so much for joining me today and giving us so much of your time. Thank you, Dean. It's been a pleasure. Again, the book is Lincoln's Secret Spy, the Civil War case that changed the future of espionage. As always, you can find the link to purchase the book at our website, historyauthor.com. We hope you will click through there, by the way. We get a few slips of Civil War script every time you do. Once again, thank you, Jane Singer, for joining us and for transporting us back in time to the era of good stealing. You can follow Jane at facebook.com slash Jane Singer author or on Twitter at Jane B. Singer and add that little digit one at the end. Let us know what you think of the book and the interview on Twitter at History Dean. And remember, if you do subscribe to us on iTunes, please leave a review. Well, that's it for this week's installment of the History Author Show. Until next Monday morning when we post a new episode, thanks so much for listening. And happy reading. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore.